Hi, it's Mike with Ucatastic. I'm here at GoToConf 2015, and I'm standing here with Jay Fields, who gave a talk on unselfish testing. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time to speak with me. Uh, so, unselfish testing, what what does that mean, and, and where did it come from? Sure. So, I used to be a consultant with mm -hmm. ThoughtWorks. Uh, I was there for several years and uh, worked with a lot of clients and mm -hmm. a lot of people that were a lot smarter than me, much more senior than me, uh, learned a lot from them, and then worked with a lot of junior people just coming out of college. And and I noticed that uh, people spent a lot of time testing, not necessarily always very effectively. Right. And uh, so I just looked for patterns that I thought would make people more effective. And uh, those turned into blog posts, which eventually turned into a book, which eventually turned into presenting today. And so, but unselfish, what what, is, what does that mean? Sure, it's, it's thinking about the team. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, whenever, say you practice TDD, mm -hmm. and so your workflow is you sit down and you write a failing test, and then you fix the test, maybe you refactor but you ever notice the emphasis is always on refactoring of the code. Right. Nobody ever says, well, okay, spend some time on the test. Mm -hmm. And so that's you're being selfish at that right. point. If you're only working on writing code for the feature that you're currently working on, you're really only thinking about yourself. You're, you're thinking about delivering that individual feature. So uh, unselfish testing is about creating tests that are more maintainable for the entire team. So you know, I may write this test and I may quit, and six months down the road, you're tasked with fixing a test because the domain has changed or something's changed. Yeah. And now you have a broken test that I wrote that I wrote for my purposes that I didn't really think about you. I was selfish. So you have a test that you have to spend more time debugging. Yeah. So it, in, it, in my presentation, it actually show a really kind of a selfish test. And it takes you 10 minutes, 10, 10 steps. It's really 10 minutes and 10 steps just to get to the expected mm -hmm. value of the test. Yeah, I, I, it, it's so funny that, that you that that's so appropriate. I hadn't really articulated that. I look at open source projects and one of the first things I do when I'm trying to understand what they're doing is go look at the test. And I was just feeling the pain looking at a library yesterday saying, you know, what what is the call, like how do I call this certain method in, in their little DSL? But when I looked at it, they actually had YAML that was loaded and then they did some like reflection on their own API, which caused the tests to execute and validate that it worked, which is great. But it didn't tell me anything about how or why it worked. So I'm, now I'm trying to parse whether I'm dealing with their DSL or I'm dealing with a DSL that's in the test framework. And that's not an R spec thing, that's just their meta programming around generating a bunch of data. Sure. Yeah, that's a common problem is you write a test and you think, okay, well, I have a lot of different ideas. In mm -hmm. How do I abstract some of this out and kind of put it in a common place? And if you have an idea that kind of flows throughout your entire test suite, then it's great to abstract it because you coming in, you look at the first test and you're kind of lost and then you find the abstractions, but those are valuable across the whole test suite. Mm -hmm. And that's good. But if you come in and you, there's there's a grouping of tests, just a couple different tests, and they have to connect to read some YAML or go yeah. through some specific DSL, and then you spend all of this time reading just trying to figure out the test. And right. that doesn't even help you with the underlying open source library. Yeah. You're just trying to understand this test. And the person who wrote it, they probably wrote something that's very sophisticated and not too hard to work with mm -hmm. if you know what you're doing. Yeah, yeah, right? exactly. But when you come to it fresh, yeah. it's a different world. Yeah, I, like especially like this was a DSL that I was, or they had a DSL for the configuration so it's already there there's that overhead of trying to just figure out how they're doing the DSL right much less which method do I call to register XYZ with a with the framework and it's like oh man meanwhile you just want to learn the framework right you don't want to learn how clever they were in their tests yeah and that's really the problem with a lot of the stuff you see out there is people are very clever in their tests mm -hmm. but they don't realize that 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 Cleverness does not help future maintainers until you internalize it, but you're forcing someone to internalize right. it, right? They have no choice but to internalize all of that complication. Yeah, and if they're just coming to an API and they got a task to do, and they're trying to just say, oh, how can I use this thing to do my task? Then they have to spend hours just to figure out oh no, it's not going to work. <laughs> you know? And I don't think anyone's doing it yeah. maliciously. It's just like before we didn't even write tests. Mm -hmm. And then we all kind of dove in to just writing tests yeah. all the time. And nobody took a step back and not enough people, in my opinion, took a step back and said, why are we writing this test? Mm -hmm. You know, Did it help us write the code? Well, that's a different test maybe than did it help us maintain the code? And maybe even that is different than documentation or having someone come fresh to a framework and try to understand it. They're different tests. And it's, it sounds like the kind of problem that Gherkin and Cucumber were trying to solve in a way where they were shooting at using these descriptive steps to say, like, this is what it's supposed to do. I mean, of course, there were some 
complexity in, in the background to, to actually do the thing. But, I, I mean, do you touch on that at all in your talk, how some frameworks seem to be trying to make things a little bit more human on, on the surface, at least? Or is that... I didn't really touch on it. I mean, mm -hmm. but I have opinions on it. Obviously, um, you know, I think I think teams should basically just work with what makes them successful. Mm -hmm. But uh, I don't think anybody should adopt that stuff thinking yeah. it's the silver bullet. Or well, no, but I mean, but the thought process towards that of, of saying, okay, we're going to make this so that we it's human readable first, right? And then machine implement. I, I think it'll vary by team. Some okay. teams will benefit from that, and maybe they'll use it for documentation. Mm -hmm. There are teams that have a lot of success with kind of BDD style stuff, but it's not for everyone. You know. Okay. There are also people who want just concise, no-nonsense, maintainable tests, don't care about generating documentation, mm -hmm. don't care about using the tests for customer collaboration. Mm -hmm. And that's what it comes down to. You have to, what's your motivator? Right. You have to understand, like, well, what's the point of the Gherkin test if only programmers are ever going to look at it? Right. Is it really helpful? Because programmers know Ruby mm -hmm. better than they know reading regexes of strings yeah. turned into Ruby. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and also, just kind of going a little further, thinking about, as you were talking Talking about um, you know having these really creative tests and maybe refactor to the to the hilt. I mean, is maybe DR, DRY not necessarily the best thing when you're inside of a test? Yeah, I mean that was that's definitely strong in my talk. Uh, it really depends on the team, but I would say the larger the team, the less uh, DRY or, or being dry is the appropriate choice mm -hmm. because. The larger the team, the more likely you are to run into a test that you've never seen before. Well, I guess it makes sense what context we're talking about. Within an individual test, obviously, you don't want to repeat ideas. Right. And within an entire test suite, say, um, some type of factory that creates all of your test instances, that creates a test instance with uh, default values. Right. Very helpful, obviously, and used throughout everywhere. So dry that up and reuse it everywhere. It's one concept reused everywhere. That's great. Right. But when you say, well, this group of tests in this file is one thing, and this is another thing and this is another thing and for this group the setup is these parts of setup are applied and for this group these parts of setup are applied <laughs> but that's not really true setup is always applied everywhere right. and so you, you have that con conceptual overhead and then any helper methods you have there's more overhead and uh, I, I don't if you're the person that wrote it and you're the only only person that ever maintains the code, then that's probably fine. Dry it out however you want because it's going to be your mental model and just go with it. Right. No criticisms there. But if you work on, say, a 10-person team and you start drying things out and hiding a little complexity over here and hiding a little complexity over here, you're, you're not really reducing complexity. You're just hiding it in different places. And so now when that test is broken, you're forcing me not only to understand that complexity, but I have to go find it as well. Right. So I find that frustrating and selfish. So what would be something that uh, as somebody who's sitting down and, and looking at implementing a test suite around a new product, what are some maybe some rules of thumb that they might want to have in mind when they're as they're kind of contemplating or writing their test suite? Uh, first thing is just know your motivators. Know what's really important to you. Do you want to do you want to do TDD? Okay, well that that means you should I don't know write a test for everything. Just start there. Okay, so now I have a motivator that's going to cause me to write a test for everything. Great. Is code coverage? I'm not really a fan of 100% code coverage, but some people are. That's going to be a motivator for some of your tests. If you're not 100% code coverage, then you probably don't need to say test the methods of a framework that you're using. They're probably right. already tested, right? So know your motivators. I mean, the motivator of customer acceptance is another common one. Your manager told you to is another common one. There are a lot of reasons that people write tests. So the first thing, just know what what direction your motivators are even putting. In. So let's say that you only care about TDD for design. And another thing, another another way that I like to look at my test is all ROI, return on investment. Mm -hmm. And so say you only care about TDD and you only care about ROI. So cool, TDD everything, get the get the benefits of TDD and um, get your improved design. You know, everything that everybody's been talking about, TDD, do that. But just because you wrote a test doesn't mean that it has to stay there. Right. right. It doesn't need to live there. Instead, I look at my tests, I prefer to look at my tests through ROI. <laughs> and so every test has an ROI, negative or positive. And so say you write a test, say you're an insurance company and you need to look your customers up by social security number. Mm -hmm. So social needs to be correct. So you have a validation on social, but you don't need to get correct that they have no integers in their name. 
because right. there's no business value in keeping integers out of a name other than maybe you know one in a hundred, one in a million, you get a customer who's annoyed because you put an integer in there, but they're not going to cancel their insurance because you put an integer yeah. in their name, right? Right. So you don't necessarily need to test for that. But maybe you still TDD the feature, verifying that there's no no integers in the name. You TDD it and you get the good design benefits, and then you delete the test because if that gets broken, if there is a regression, it's minimal impact to the business. Yeah. Actually, uh, you, you you brought up the next question I was going to ask about calling tests and that a lot of teams I've seen uh, will take a, a test suite and treat it like it's a synchrosynced thing that can never be like once it's implemented you can't touch it and just uh, sometimes I look at tests and I'm like why are we even testing this it doesn't matter yeah um, and people are afraid to delete it because they don't know why they're testing it and why does it matter. And yeah. I think that falls back to, I don't know what my motivation for testing is. If mm -hmm. maybe I can't delete that because it's 100% code coverage, or you know, my manager said this area needs to be 100% or something like that. But most of the time, that's not the case. Most of the time, it's just like, well, this is a test, so I can't possibly delete it because, you know, imagine what would go wrong if somebody yeah. found out I deleted it. Yeah. <laughs> but if yeah. you think about it, you know, really, if, if I deleted a test that was stopping a regression and we had that regression and it had almost no or no impact to the business, mm -hmm. then it's really not a big deal, right? right. So you mentioned that you, you have authored a book. What was your what's your book title? Uh, Working Effectively with Unit Tests. Working Effectively with Unit Tests. Yeah. And uh, is that a, a Java-centric book or is it general purpose? I would say it's general purpose, but it's uh, it's Java examples, which I know uh, it's hard for some people to swallow. Uh, I personally um, love dynamic languages, but uh, I wanted it I wanted to make it accessible to the most people. So Java C like the good default choice. Okay. Um, so it was working effectively with unit tests. Working effectively with unit tests. It's on LeanPub, so DRM free. Uh, okay. All the good programmer stuff. All right, great. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to speak with me. Appreciate Thanks it. Thanks a lot. Yep.